My name is Rick Evans. Over the years, I've led many San Francisco walking tours for the Commonwealth Club and currently the owner and operator of Art and Architecture Virtual Tours. I'll be your moderator for today. A special welcome to our club travelers. We appreciate you joining us today. As a club continues to host virtual events, they're grateful for continued support of their members and donors. We hope you will also consider making a donation online or text donate to 415-329-4231. It's my pleasure today to introduce Gary Camilla and Paul Madonna, the author and illustrator behind the wonderful new book, Spirits of San Francisco, Voyages Through the Unknown City. Gary has been a fixture of the Bay Area literary scene for more than 30 years. He writes a popular history column for the San Francisco Chronicle and was a co-founder of Salon.com and former executive editor of San Francisco Magazine. His previous book, Cool Gray City of Love, 49 Views of San Francisco, won the Northern California Book Award for creative nonfiction and is considered to be one of the best books ever written about the city. Paul is an award-winning artist who work, whose work can be found in museums and galleries around the world. His popular series, All Over, uh, All Over Coffee, ran in the San Francisco Chronicle for 12 years. He is the author of five books, including the Emmett Hopper Mystery Series. Paul was a founding editor of the Rumpus.net, and has taught drawing uh, for the University of San Francisco. We are here today to celebrate Gary and Paul's new book, what I call a poetic look at the city from different points of views. So let's quickly review the format for today. Our whole conversation is going to be about 60 minutes in total, 40 minutes of discussion between the three of us and followed about 20 minutes of audience questions. So the audience, be sure to be ready to post your questions. So Gary and Paul, welcome. I'd Thank like to start off by saying that I'm so looking forward to this conversation today. I personally have been leading walking tours of San Francisco for over 15 years, and I share the passion you both have in discovering new and fresh perspectives of the city. So as we heard in the introduction, Gary, you are a critically acclaimed author with several published books and involved in many projects. Paul, you are a critically acclaimed artist also with several books and many projects. So to start off, what prompted the two of you to get together to work on this process of blending the image and text together? Paul, why don't we let you go first on that? Sure, well, uh, I was first invited to work with Gary on his book, Cool Gray City of Love. Um, but Bloomsbury had called me and, and asked me if I was interested, but the time timeline was very short, especially when I read the subtitle, 49 Views of San Francisco. And uh, so unfortunately I had to pass, but not because of lack of interest. So I called up Gary and I said, hey, you know, listen, I would love to work with you someday. And we were actually at uh, an event for the Northern California Book Awards. Gary was receiving an award for Cool Gray City and I was actually receiving an award for my second book, Everything Is Its Own Reward. Uh, and so we met in person that night and we, we hit it off immediately. I mean, within seconds we were laughing as if we had been old friends forever. And, uh, and you know, again, I, I said, hey, I'm really sorry I didn't get to work on this, but we shook hands that night and said, all right, we're gonna find a project someday. That, that we start from scratch. So, uh, and, and that was, you know, five, six years ago. So on a handshake, we had that in the back of our heads. And then fast forward a few years later, when I was retooling a series for the Knob Hill Gazette, um, I thought of Gary and I called him up and I said, all right, let's, here's our chance. Let's start from scratch and let's build something. So we, you know, we began this by doing a monthly series, but always with the idea of a book involved. Gary, you want to, you want to add some details? Yeah, I mean, I was a huge fan of Paul's. I knew his work from uh, all over coffee in the Chronicle. I'd seen his work in uh, gallery shows. And as Paul said, uh, you know, we reached out to him to try to illustrate Cool Gray City, but you know, Paul does not, uh, he, his work is, is intricate and time consuming and 
49 views, in fact, meant 49 views, 49 illustrations. And I think the deadline was something like six weeks or I don't know. It was very it wasn't going to work, but uh, it was great when we Paul and I actually met. We hit it off, as he said. And uh, when he invited me to discuss what became this book, I came over to his uh, studio, his old studio on Potrero Avenue. And uh, it was just, my mind was blown there. Sitting there on an easel was about a four by five foot drawing of Lombard Street, the famous, overly famous crooked block of Lombard Street that's virtually impossible to even see without your mind just going into a kind of received postcard mode. But this uh, drawing was so hallucinatory uh, it was like a wide angle of view, <laughs> like an ant on acid would see Lombard Street. And, uh, you know, I was just completely entranced by this. And I, you know, expected to be, but this was remarkable. And it was perfect for the, prog uh, the, the project that we decided to embark on, because Paul had been doing a series for the Knob Hill Gazette that featured a lot more iconic, if you will, famous, well-known sites than Paul was known for. Paul, those who know Paul's earlier, most of uh, his, his very well-known long-running strip in the Chronicle, um, all over coffee and everything, his own reward, the, these, these images of San Francisco tended to be small, obscure, strange, poetic in their, in their obscurity and their minutia and their unknownness. So uh, to take on big, famous sites like Lombard Street or the Palace of Fine Arts was a whole new direction. And uh, we, we, you know, we just decided, yeah, let's, let's work on this new project for the retooled uh, series for the Knob Hill Gazette, um, where I'll do a historical vignettes of these, of these sites, but it wasn't only going to be famous sites. We wanted to do both a combination of the famous sites and the, and the kind of obscure unknown things that one of the many reasons Paul and I get along so well is we both love that stuff. The more obscure and weird, the better. And if it has some crazy story that emerges from its obscurity, which it almost always does, better still. So that was the genesis of our collaboration first in the Knob Hill Gazette, which continues uh, to this day. But as Paul mentioned, we had in mind from the beginning uh, doing something that would be like this book. And in fact, that's just what happened. Yeah. Well, you know, most of us have lived in the Bay Area and for so long, and we take for granted what makes San Francisco so special, right? And uh, there is the issue of the iconic San Francisco that every tourist knows, or we could repeat all the time, and the obscure. And uh, I think that's what you're just speaking to what you were just talking about there. Uh, was there any struggle of finding that right blend? Just trying to figure out how iconic do I wanna be? Do I wanna forget all about iconic images or just go to the obscure? Now, Paul, why don't you start on that one? Sure, yeah, you know, the, the interesting thing is Gary said is for All Over Coffee, I sort of refused to do iconic scenes. It was, it was a thing for me. I would joke that if I saw a crowd of people pointing their cameras in one direction, I would turn around and draw what was behind them. <laughs> but uh, the point of that was really that, you know, San Francisco for me has so much beauty that isn't just postcard beauty. And, and my job as, a, as an artist, as a creative person was to sort of be able to mine that and show that to people. And at the same time, you know, I, you know it's, it's hard to do the same thing over and over again. I needed to refresh my own creative habits and, and try to bring something new to a new audience. And so that was my desire to finally turn around and, and face that same direction as all the cameras. And it posed a really interesting uh, uh, creative challenge because then I had to figure out how do I bring something new to, to something that we have all seen before. And Gary talks about coming into the studio and seeing that drawing of Lombard Street and the amazing, I mean, I, I knew that it was going to work even before we agreed, or at least I, I felt that way in the back of my mind. But the first thing he did is he walked over to the drawing and he pointed to one of the, the buildings and he just starts telling me a story. And, uh, and, and I felt like exactly, he could see the, the story in the drawing. And, and in a way, even though I took a different view on it, it was his ability to immediately see something in it that, uh, that I felt like, all right, this is going to work. But to answer your question about the back and forth, 
And that also spawned a conversation between Gary and I of, well, what do we love? Well, we love both. We love the iconic and we also love the in-between. And so this idea of sort of going back and forth and finding those stories was, was this true collaboration. And I think that's one of the most interesting things about this book is that we didn't start off with a list of sites like, oh, we need to bring this history out again. Um, it was, what do we like? And, and it, was, it was, Gary, what do you want to tell a story about? And then, okay, can I draw this? And then on the other side, I would say, Gary, I'm, I want to draw this thing. I, I found this cool site. Do you know any stories about it? And so I think that that force is, is a, a strong word, but it allowed us to see through each other's eyes. And I think that's a really beautiful part of collaboration because I, I drew places that I might not have chosen to draw on my own, but certainly found a way to bring my, myself to them. Well, that's a, uh, it's a good transition to my next question. Uh, through all your, uh, for, uh, Paul, for any, all, all your drawings that you've done, uh, is there one place that was totally new to you in this collaboration? Working with Gary, that was new to you. Uh, so to me, the place that was new, um, yeah, Shipley Street, and actually, I was was you know, it was, uh, Gary and I found this, or rather, Gary took me to this site on a day that we were out driving around, and he had told me about the story of it. And I'm going to pull up an image of Shipley Street, and actually, I'd like Gary to tell the story about it because. Uh, I, when I saw this for the first time, I, I was like a little kid and uh, I immediately just said, I want to draw this. I want to draw this. Uh, and, and the story is fantastic. So, Gary, please, do you want to talk about that? Yeah. Well, I mean, first of all, Paul, some of the most fun times Paul and I had on this whole project were these scouting expeditions where we would just careen all over San Francisco, you know, all really obscure places on the waterfront you know, going places where we weren't supposed to be, climbing out on old collapsing piers. And I always knew that I wanted to show Paul uh, Shipley Street and some of the surrounding streets. I, I had first heard about these streets in a U.S. geological survey publication called the Earthquake Subsidence Zone. And as many of, of the uh, you listeners know, um, most of South of Market uh, was built on the former swamps of Mission Bay, and in some cases actually on Mission Bay itself. So it was very unstable land. It was called made land in those days. It was landfill, basically, and not sophisticated landfill at that. And uh, in the 1906 quake, uh, a lot of this land subsided. The buildings were destroyed, but they built buildings on the landfill after the quake. And then later they graded the street up to grade, which was far above the, the subsiding area. And as you can see from this amazing drawing, uh, this building is basically buried, half buried. Um, those, those doors you see at the bottom are like, that should be a garage. It's like four or five feet. The building goes four or five feet down. Uh, below the ground. And there's a number of these buildings, although a number of them were damaged so seriously in the 1989 quake that they had to be destroyed. But there's still a few of them. And uh, I actually uh, discovered this particular building when I was working on Cool Gray City of Love. And I waited for uh, one of the tenants to come out and I asked him, you know, what's, what's it like inside that building? <laughs> he said, the, the hallways are completely cattywampus that you know, if you roll a marble down it, it just rolls completely to one side. And there's a lot of buildings south of market like that. So it was really fun uh, to go and show that to Paul. And as soon as he saw it, he was like, oh my God, I can totally see this. I, you know, he, you, you probably saw those fantastic wires going overhead. Uh, wires are a real Paul specialty. Uh, and uh, so that was, that was really a, a, an exciting, uh, uh, fun thing to discover together. But just adding to what Paul was saying before about the collaborative process, what was so rich and, and fun about it was it took both of us out of our comfort zone because Paul would... Uh, discover a, a site and say, wow, I really want to draw this. And there were a number of times when I had no idea what the stories were. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it was kind of like just being dealt a, a, a hand in poker. And it's like, okay, uh, like, hey, I want you to draw this. This is a, you know, it's a fantastic site. This floats your boat. 
let's see what I can do with it. Uh, and the most notable example of that, uh, maybe you can show this, Paul, was a very strange building right near Paul's old studio called the Rock House. And uh, it's an extraordinary building. So th this is um, around Mariposa and San Bruno streets. And probably anyone who's ever driven down Highway 101 actually may have noticed that uh, that roof um, when you see it from the from the highway. And it's a uh, really, really obscure, though, because that part of Potrero Hill is sort of orphaned. It's cut off by the 101 freeway. So most people don't really even go up there. And uh, so I, you know, I may have seen it in my wanderings, but I'm not really sure if I if I had or if I certainly I didn't remember it. And uh, but, you know, what's incredible about it is it stands on this enormous platform of serpentine or serpentinite, the uh, California state rock, which is one of the rocks that runs in diagonal strips all across Calif all across San Francisco. And this house, without doubt, has the biggest rock platform of any, any house in the city. Um, and it turned out that this building, in fact, had a really remarkable story. Um, the story that involved a, uh, an eccentric minister who was the first of the great anti-Victorian architects, a guy named Joseph Worcester. And he built this building to have to help uh you know uh, orphaned and abandoned and abused boys um he was a very very saintly wonderful man who <laughs> reminded a lot of people of jesus christ he was thought even to look like jesus christ and uh he uh he erected this building in the early 20th century and it then went through more bizarre transformations including being used as the studio of a famous art designer and director named Rudolf Schaefer, who lived to be a hundred years old and, you know, got, had lost his studio in North Beach and was looking around for a new one. And he went to a psychic and the psychic said, I see an old building uh, on the edge of a hill with a bunch of broken windows <laughs> that turned out to be this building. And he ended up taking it over. Before that, it was used as a male dormitory for San Francisco State, of all things, when San Francisco State was briefly located over in the Haight. Uh, so the building just has this incredible history, and then it ends uh, either, in, you know, depressingly or just, you know, in very contemporary fashion, entering modern San Francisco real estate values. And, you know, it's now worth some ungodly amount of money, it has like a great room that's got a 25 or 30 foot elevation that looks over the entire city. Um, but it's a, it's a fantastically odd, beautiful, strange place. And I would never have like even looked into it had Paul not seen it in his wanderings around San Francisco when we had his studio there. So that was just a great example of the kind of serendipity that this collaboration uh, produced. Well, talking about that process, did you guys find yourselves uh, ever walking together just saying, let's go out and do a walk and see what's out here? Or did you do it individually? Did you check in with each other? How, how did that all happen? Well, what, after that first day in my studio where uh, Gary saw the Lombard Street drawing, um, you know, he sent me a long list of sites that he said, hey, I think these will be really interesting. And what of these grab you? that you think you might want to draw. And, you know, I, I'm going to keep talking about the collaboration. And I think both of he and I will, because from the very beginning, it was, we set out that we had to both like, like, the, like the choice. And, um, and if it didn't work for either one of us, it was off the list. And that was just the way it went. And there was sort of no ego. There was no like, no, I have to have this thing in here. It was about how do we create this collection where we both can bring our best best work to, and um, and so from that list of sites, I picked a handful and I said, "Oh, these sound really interesting." So we scheduled a day to go out and drive around, and um, and I mean they, that was it was so much fun just going down the street. I mean, Gary's every every block we pass, Gary's pointing out the window and he's just telling me stories about this and this, and I'm trying to take notes. I'm like, "Oh, let's go back there. Oh, let's go back there," and then we'd go stop somewhere and would walk around for half an hour, an hour, and. And I would take tons of photographs for references. And uh, I think the really the best part of that, of being together, was Gary would be telling a story 
and I would be looking for the composition. You know, while, while I'm listening and I'd say, oh, Gary, I could draw this. And I'd sort of hold my hands up. I'm like, can you see it? And he's like, yeah, well, all right, I can frame the story that way. Uh, but, but this is the point of view of the story. And then I'd look around and say, okay, well, what about this? And, and it really was like we had our own camera lenses. One was, was the historical story and the other was the visual. And we wanted those two frames to line up together, almost like a stereoscope. Right? So that when you saw them together, they created this three-dimensional picture. And that could not have happened had we not been there together. And also if we weren't able to be on the same page with each other. You know, I wasn't, uh, I wasn't fixed on, oh, well, this is the composition that I draw. And in fact, I didn't want to do that anymore. You know, I wanted to say, okay, look at this in a different way. And I think, Gary, maybe this is a good segue to, uh, to Pier 24. Mm. Because... Uh, I think Pier 24 is, I, I, I'm going to show you this drawing. It's a composition that I love so much. And it's definitely a, one of my compositions. It's got a lot of geometry in it. But I don't know that I would have chosen this site or, or I mean, I would have stopped to see it if I had been walking by because the light, the shadow, the composition would grab me. But um, the Gary's stories and, and for bringing me specifically to this place and for me to walk around and find this composition only came from from that day of being with him. Yeah, that was a that was a great day. We we went into this building on the right. Uh, the it's the Pier 24 Annex is on the left, and I guess it's Pier 26 on the right. Pier 24 actually burned down, but this uh, Pier 26 goes way out and the day we were there one of those big doors that raises up with chains we were able to sneak out on it and go out onto that sunken railroad track you can see in the center of the composition um, we went out into first into the back of the pier where as we were like wandering excitedly around <laughs> we both almost fell through a hole that was about three feet in diameter it would have resulted in us going into the bay um, it was it did not meet OSHA requirements out there and we weren't really supposed to be there and there was just like a crazy scene inside that pier there was like a bunch of fishermen had some, they're storing their nets there. And there was a woman sitting in a truck, chain smoking outside with a seagull in her lap. I mean, it was just like the damnedest thing. But, you know, to returning to Paul's, um, you know, points about, the, about how you know, illuminating the history was for him. But this, this view I've seen, we've probably anyone who's walked on the Embarcadero has looked up and seen the Bay Bridge overhead. But, you know, Paul's unique sense of perspective, his line, his shadows, you know, this this creates there's a sort of an almost a gothic quality to this. It's just you know, amazing. I've never I've never seen it like this. And the uh, um, and yeah, just it, it only makes the rich stories that are associated with this place and really brings them home. And uh, so it, that, that kind of, that kind of uh, collaboration really was fruitful there. But, uh, but another, I'd like to bring up one point that just uh, illustrates what Paul was talking about, about how, you know, we, could, we just had to leave our ego at the door and accept, happily accept uh, eat what, what each of us felt we could do and didn't want to do. I got very excited about, doing this very bizarre, enormous Victorian that's in Eureka Valley that's known as Nobby Clark's Folly. It's on Caselli uh, near 19th, an obscure Eureka Valley street. And it's I, I'm pretty sure it must be the largest Victorian in the whole southern part of the city. It's very, very weird amalgam of kind of Queen Anne style. It's just like overblown and has a bizarre story. This kind of corrupt policeman who turned lawyer, or turned like, you know, warrant shaver. You know, he was this sort of inside connected city hall guy who amassed this unseemly fortune. And then he lost it all. And there was a big water war surrounding this building. Anyway, I was very excited. I said, Paul, Paul, and it's a great building. It's so cool looking. Like go out and, and you know, uh, draw this, see what you think. And he goes out and he comes back and he goes, Gary, I'm really sorry. But, you know, I went and looked at it and it's just hit with straight Northern light. There's no shadow on it. 
And, you know, he could make up the shadows if, if he wanted to, but he doesn't, you know, that's not how he works. You know, he's, he's a he's a plain air painter and he, he he wants to use the reality of what's given. And I really respected that, you know, to me, that was like, okay, this guy's a real artist. If he can't see what is going to work uh, for him in reality, he doesn't, you know, doesn't work for him to do it. And uh, so that was a, a, a kind of, it was a great lesson in the kind of in our visual integrity that Paul had. And then it was like, oh, gee, well, we'll do the Haas Lilienthal house. And actually, I think as the results will show, that wasn't a, that wasn't too shabby a choice. Yeah. Uh, and it's, it's funny because the story behind Nobby Clark's Folly is fantastic. And it, I, it killed me to have to leave it behind, but I, uh, Gary's right. I mean, I just couldn't find an angle on it that I felt like I could actually give the the viewers something really beautiful to look at. And um, and you know, and th I think that's a a real credit to Gary and credit to our process too. The the willingness to be able to have that conversation. And I think it's a really different relationship than uh, than an, another project where let's say the publisher sent you the the book stories and you've just got to figure it out. Um, but it, that's what makes this collection of stories and drawings so interesting because we, again, we had to make them all be something that we loved and that we could really bring something to the page. Um, I'm going to show the, the Hostelian and Thal House because after we passed on Nobby Clark, we made the short list of like, okay, well, what, what are the Victorians? Because, you know, you were asking earlier about the sites that we chose and we sort of did an A, B, A, B thing where, where we're like, okay, we want to do iconic, but we also want to do the in-betweens, the unknowns. And, uh, and we, we said, we have to have a Victorian here. I mean, this is San Francisco. We can't turn our back on that. Um, and uh, so I went out and scouted a couple when I came back and I said, Gary, I can't believe it. I've actually never drawn the Hostel Lilienthal house and, and I'd, I'd love to, and I've got some great reference photos and I'd love to do this. And Gary said, all right, I've got some great stories. So what you're looking at here is a straight on shot of the Haas house. And, you know, you can see there's beautiful light on it. There's great shadows coming off the turret, uh, falling along the, along the clapboard of the front of the house. And, and uh, you know, surprisingly, more than the building, my favorite part of this is the, the railing out in front mm. and uh, drawing those shapes and drawing those shadows falling over the staircase. And so, you know, for me, I'm like, here's, here's where I can give the reader a really beautiful drawing and not just something that says, ah, oh, well, here, here's, here's uh, the best I can do for, for the, the house with the, the good story. Yeah. That's just a fa fantastic drawing. And as Paul said, you know, just about every place, once you start digging, um, you know, you find incredible stories. And uh, one of the great stories uh, about the Haas Lilienthal house is uh, a unique San Francisco subculture, the uh, Jewish elite uh, the, of, of merchant princes, many of whom came from the same tiny town in, uh, in Bavaria. Um, and, uh, you know, the, they were uh, uh, an incredible force and they were players in San Francisco's development. They came here during the gold rush, encountered much less anti-Semitism than uh, they tip Jews typically encountered on the East Coast uh, for a variety of reasons. Uh, one of the main of which was that a traditional anti-Semitic trope was always, well, Jews just want to get rich. Oh, gee, that didn't play very well in the cult rush somehow. And, uh, and it just also there was no East Coast hierarchy. The, 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 the judges were digging ditches in the plaza next to uh, sailors and working men from the humblest backgrounds because they were all out here on this great, crazy adventure, um, trying to get rich and trying to uh, make their fortune. And many of them, uh, the, these these Jewish uh, young men, mostly who had come from Bavaria, were wise enough to realize that the best way to get rich was not mining the mines. It was what was known as mining the miners. And uh, if you could sell just about anything um, at, a, at a profit, you could really do quite well. 
And um, so it, this was a fascinating subculture. Many of them actually didn't have a great deal of respect for American culture. These were, uh, even though they were sub had been subjected to some anti-Semitic laws in, in, uh, in Germany, an infamous law called the Matricale, which made it almost impossible to get married. But nonetheless, they were highly educated and they venerated German culture. Uh, you know, these were the, they, they studied Goethe and Schiller and listened to Brahms and Beethoven. And they didn't think the U.S. had anything to match that. And, and they weren't wrong. And uh, so they were a fascinating, not entirely assimilated because they almost exclusively married other Jews, but they were very acculturated. So in this great house, the Haas Lilienthal house, it was famous for decades for its opulent Christmas parties uh, and for the, the stuffed pigs, glazed pigs with apples in their mouths. And uh, it was, this was not exactly, these were not traditionally observant Jews and many of them uh, didn't really wanna have anything to do even with the high holidays. They would simply observe them because so, they'd say, well, we don't want the goys to say we're not celebrating, but they had no interest in religion. Uh, and several of them said, San Francisco is my Jerusalem. They had found San Francisco to answer all of all of their material and in many ways their spiritual needs. And then, of course, they became the city's greatest philanthropists and their uh, mark on the city's landscape endures to this day. So all of that are part of the stories of the Haas Lilienthal House, as well as um, I talk in the book about just Victorian architecture as well. What we try, what I tried to do with a lot of these stories and sort of the way the book is formatted is there's 16 chapters, 16 of Paul's fantastic drawings. And then for each one of those uh, chapters, I provided anywhere from five to 10 or 12 vignettes, uh, trying to sort of give a, a wide ranging take on a given site, because almost any site there's more than one story. And sometimes there's more than a dozen stories. Um, and uh, so that was, uh, that was a lot of fun, just sort of rummaging around and you know, finding out what, 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 how, how many different sort of things happened here. And, and what, can you, what can you illuminate this one place uh, historically with? So when you say fun, it must have also been frustrating with so many stories to pick out the right one, right? And uh, maybe- Oh, right no, one. no doubt. I mean, there- <laughs> I so, so many history. were, so many were left on the cutting room floor and that's well, just, yeah. That was a question I was going to ask you. Oh, yeah. That if you, yeah, how, that must have been a struggle. What do I put in? What do I leave out? And is there a, um, you know, if you can share it, a 17th story that didn't make it, that almost no. made it, but it was a line that was cut. Oh, yeah. I mean, another a whole nother. Uh, Paul, did, did we we must have had a few that got close that didn't make it. Um, there was one early on. Uh, what is it? It's uh, is Leia's Creek, maybe. Oh, uh, um, yeah. Maybe we were going to do do or were we going to do something in Glen Canyon? Um, I can't remember. Yeah, I, and that one, we realized there was a lot to do. We sort of. Oh, I, but you know what we were? You know what we wanted? I wanted to do this and I think it just didn't. It was just was a little too hard to read visually um was el poland spring ah uh, that's in, it that's in, what in I'm the presidio that's right. which is a really fantastic evocative poetic amazing sight um you know spring i just have a thing for springs in the city in any case i've gone out on walks with the great uh spring meisters of san francisco including joel pomerantz who is fantastic book about it and is a leading expert, Chris Carlson, who's a real civic treasure, and a couple of other major uh, experts on water. And those were two of the most fun days I ever had in San Francisco. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm just walking around looking at springs. So El Polin is kind of the, the granddaddy because it's the most historic and it dates back to Spanish days. Mm -hmm. The Spanish who were a uh, uh, settled in the Presidio um, of this woman that I call San Francisco's mother, Juana Briones, lived right on El Poland Spring. And um, then she later moved to another spring and people would live on springs for obvious reasons in those days. So that was one that would have been fantastic historically, but 
when you go out there and it's been beautifully daylighted by the Presidio Trust, the whole Tennessee Valley uh, watershed has been opened and they did a really great job. But even the, the original spring, even though it's more opened up now and you can kind of see it, you know, behind a little, you know, informal kind of fence, it's, it's pretty obscure. Water's trickling over an old stone wall. Uh, it, it doesn't, it's not, doesn't show up too well. And I'm not sure how that would have really worked visually. So anyway, that one, uh, that one didn't make it. And, and there were, I think a few others as well that we certainly had discussions about, but yeah, you, everything had to come together for both of us to, uh, to right. uh, for it, for it to work out. A question that I'm, I'm curious about is, um, uh, how should people approach your book uh, as a history book, as a guidebook? Uh, what should people come away from reading it? Oh. If, I, if I'm just new to San Francisco and I want to pick up, I go to the bookstore and I pick up, a, I want a guidebook. Is that the right book or is it for somebody who lives in San Francisco and say, I, get, I want to know more about San Francisco and get a new perspective? Where do you think Paul, the audience is? Paul, you want to take a first crack at that one? Oh, really? So I, I, I think that's your wheelhouse. Oh, well, yeah. I'm happy to I'm happy to weigh in. I mean, I I feel like, no, it's not a guidebook unless you are um, deeply eccentric and, you know, already have a considerable knowledge of San Francisco. This shouldn't be, I mean, I'm, I might be shooting mass book sales in the <laughs> foot with this, but this shouldn't be your first guidebook to San Francisco. It's very deep. It's kind of wonky. I tried to write some of it, at least actually for like people that really know a lot of history to try to give even them some new information, because once, you know, you get into this, there's a whole fraternity of San Francisco, you know, historians and walkers and geeks and experts of all kinds who just know an incredible amount. But I didn't want to only write it for them. Um, it, it really is written for the general reader uh, in the sense that we have Paul's fantastic drawings that immediately draw everyone in with their mystery and their majesty and their obscurity and their surreality and their intensity. And, and then you uh, get a lot by the time, even though there's a lot of detail in the stories of this book, you also learn a lot about the overall history of the city because it's just, a lot of it is just communicated in this kind of, it's like a micro macro way. You know, there's very, there's a lot of, of, in, of information, but it does add up to something larger. So I think we're, you know, we're looking for people who love cities um, and love any city. It doesn't have to be San Francisco, people who love to walk, People who like to look at things and people who like to think about things that should cover most readers. <laughs> and, most readers. and it's, it's pretty, it's pretty broad. You know, I, I know some people that only pick up a book and, and if it doesn't have pictures in it, then they don't get it. Right. <laughs> and uh, if it's just too much text. So this is the beauty of this book is right. It really kind of serves both. If, if I want that real historic perspective, it's there. If I just want to look at those great illustrations, that's there too. Now, the perspective of the city that you give in this book is, um, it, let's bring it back to what's happening right now with the pandemic and mm -hmm. how the city is being criticized for the condition it's in. What's, what do you say to people that the city is not what it used to be? And you guys probably have a, a great uh, perspective of that because you're, you got one step you know, into the nostalgia and then the next step into what's happening today. Well, I, I think that it's really hard to, to say what the city is right now because we are in such a flux. Right. But I know I've been here for 26 years. Gary's been here. Uh, Gary, you, were you, you were born in San Francisco. No, I was born in Oakland. I grew up in Berkeley, right. but I've lived in right. the city for fi almost 50 years. Right. And, and uh, I mean, you've seen more changes than I have. Uh, but one of the things that I love about San Francisco is that it is constantly reinventing itself. And that's the really interesting thing about its history for me is that we can sort of take each decade and have a cultural conversation, but then we can also have a, uh, an architectural conversation. We can have a, um, probably even have a geological conversation, right? Uh, and so, you know, the, it's COVID, we were finishing this book during COVID and Gary wrote a new an introduction that we hadn't planned because we were thinking, 
yeah, this book should be a perennial seller. It's not, it doesn't need to be read just today and then is obsolete. No, this book should be on the shelf for, for decades, hopefully, and, and even longer. And we thought, wow, here's a chance to actually be able to put something that says, this is what the city is like right now. And so I did a, a drawing as well of a boarded up storefront along Valencia Street. And there was this really wonderful sense for me of we're, we're, we're not creating history, we're, we're marking the moment so that just like all these other stories, it in itself will be history five, 10, 20 years from now. And another just side point, Gary was talking about my uh, drawing of Shipley Street and the wires and, and, uh, and I love drawing the wires in San Francisco because they're these beautiful compositional elements uh, that, that can frame a page, but they're also, they mark a period of time. And I, you know, I have to say, I didn't realize that when I first started drawing it, I was just looking at the, the world and around me and drawing what I saw. But as time goes on, those wires aren't going to be there. Mm -hmm. And in themselves, they are going to be contextual historical elements. And so to, you know, for Gary to write a piece about this is what it's like to, uh, to be finishing the book during lockdown and to do this drawing, you know, I, I, at the same time, I think, you know, we're, we're contributing to that historical, uh, you know, the, the bookshelf of it. I love it. Yeah, it's a great, yeah, reinventing itself is a, is a great way of looking at it, I think. Uh, good, good, great, great answer. So um, we're gonna take a couple questions from people that have sent us. If anybody's out there and you want to uh, send in a question, please do so in the chat box. We have a question for Paul. Uh, what was the hardest building you've ever drawn? And, or what building took you the longest time to draw? Uh, hardest and or longest. Um, I'd say the, the, the most challenging buildings that I've drawn are the ones that we are the most familiar with. It's, it's not so much the visual subject matter. Some are certainly more complicated than others. I mean, wide uh, cityscapes where you have hundreds of buildings in them are, are very challenging because of just creating the topography. Uh, but it's, it's not so much the, the act of making the marks on the page that is the challenge. It is how do I breathe some life into something in a way that you, unlike what you've seen before. And actually I'm gonna pull up a drawing of the Palace of Fine Arts, which um, I did really early on in the series. And I'd say was the most challenging drawing I've done, not because of the detail. In fact, the detail was super fun. I mean, that's the stuff I really geek out on because for me as a creative person, I want to be able to, to render these, these shapes in this light and shadow, but it was how many you know, photos have we seen of the Palace of Fine Arts? I mean, for a hundred years, there have been drawings, lithographs, paintings, photographs. Um, how could I bring something new to it? And my way was to start with the framing, which was to have this, the, the stark column on the left side and we have a little bit of those leaves peeking out. And then on the right side, we have the leaves peeking out and, and that's an extreme foreground. And I felt like that was something that you never got from, from any of the representations of the Palace of Fine Arts. Whereas when I went there, that's what I felt. I felt that I was underneath the, those columns or, or the archways and looking out over the grand view. And I wanted to put the viewer right there behind one of those columns as well. And, um, you know, and of course the, the compositional elements and then the light and shadow, I, but those are, those are the technical parts. So it, I think it's an abstract answer. It's how do I bring something new? Right. Uh, another question is, uh, the, what's your most favorite, you might have already answered this, you may want to bring it up again, the most favorite obscure location in San Francisco. You may be hesitant to reveal it for the fear of it being overrun. Um, okay, I'll answer quickly and then I think yeah. Gary, yeah, I, I want to know what Gary has to say about this too, because maybe that's you know, the next spirits piece. Um, I, you know, I, you know I, I, I live in the Excelsior now and I had been to McLaren Park once, I'm embarrassed to say, oh. before I'm in, in the 20 years I had lived here before I moved out to the Excelsior, I'd only been there once. Uh, it's, it's sort of the places that 
you know, they're not the Mission or North Beach or South of Market, you know, where we're, we're used to going or that we think of as quintessential San Francisco. But, you know, I love to walk around the streets of my neighborhood, of the Excelsior. And um, and just the other day, I was walking through Mission Terrace, which is uh, sort of the adjacent neighborhood. And there are all these alleys, literally dirt alleys, that um, are sort of half blocks. So that at the back of the houses, instead of a classic San Francisco block, you know, has uh, the backs of houses meet up to each other. So you can't really see them from the street. You have to be in somebody's back porch or an aerial view. Well, here, they, instead of them sharing backyards, there were actually dirt, uh, dirt alleyways. And I couldn't believe it. I suddenly, I was like, what city am I in? And, and it, you know, so that's today's favorite hidden spot. But it's also, you know, the, the, the neighborhood that you don't always walk in. Like, there's so much beauty and interesting stuff about San Francisco that it, I feel for myself, even after 26 years, is still untouched. Right. Gary? Yeah. I mean, there's so many. I mean, it's almost every walk I take, I find something I've never seen before. Uh, one of the big neighborhoods and areas that is relatively little known and is really extraordinary is Glen Canyon. Um, Glen Canyon is this sort of mind-blowing deep gash right in the heart of the city with Islas Creek running through it. Um, you know, there's a live stream running right through the middle of this, comes right down from the School of the Arts up at the head of Portola. This is an enormous, uh, deep, you know, the, the wa rock walls are 100 feet high. And um, they're made out of radiolarian shirt, uh, which is, you know, this extraordinarily fascinating rock. There's all kinds of great little streets up above it with little gardens and strange, you know, sort of hanging streets. Uh, so that's a really you know, not not as well appreciated as it as it could be. But also, I concur with Paul um, dirt. The, 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 the few dirt streets and dirt lanes that are left in San Francisco. And there's, for some reason, there's a number of them actually in, in Glen Park, the neighborhood that's right by Glen Canyon. There's a couple of streets. There's one called Ohlone Way, which is a perfect name for it. There's one called Poppy Lane or Poppy Way that is, I think, the longest of the dirt streets. There used to be one on the, on the far side of Bernal. And that, that, uh, eastern side of Bernal Heights also has incredibly great, obscure, strange labyrinthine alleys and streets and gaps and fences that lead out onto unclaimed, probably city owned land that's unused. And you can sneak out there and look out over the freeway. So I love all that stuff. And you know, often, sometimes I'll just be driving around and I'll say, oh, hmm, there's a strange green patch or a brown patch uh, in the middle of the city. Let's go see what that is. And in most cities, anything like that is like behind padlocks and you can't get to it. But in San Francisco, often you get there and it's like, oh, there's just this patch of land and you can kind of push your way through some, whatever it may be. If it's over in Hunter's Point, you know, you push your way through an old hole in a fence and pass, pass some tires and you're out on some polluted beach. Or if it's, you know, in Bernal Heights, you know, you go through an old, you know, gap in the fennel bushes and you're over the freeway. But uh, there's just no end of these things and anyone can find them if you're um, uh, curious and are willing to do a little bit of kind of Huck Finn exploring uh, in the urban, uh, ur urban landscape. Yeah, curiosity. Uh, another question here uh, for um, Paul. What's the hardest building you ever drawn and or what? building took the longest time to draw. Oh, I was fascinated with the difficulty or the time. <laughs> uh, it's the, the thing is, is that uh, I draw, some drawings are four by six inches, other are literally four by five feet. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so when it comes down to, I, I can draw the same building at, at nine inches and, and also by, at five feet. And the, the level of detail that I'm going to put into them is going to change. Uh, it's, I just, I think I just don't think of it that way. Um, again, like the Nobby Clark folly, it wasn't that I, that I went up and it was daunting and I thought, Oh, I, I can't do this. It's too much detail or something. I just looked at it and I said, there's no good light and I can't get a good perspective on this unless I, you know, 
break in or like go in. And I could have knocked on doors across the streets and, you know, maybe found somebody's, you know, bedroom that they'd let me draw from and come back. And, and I, and I have done things like that. I've been invited into homes to draw particular views of the city, but um, you know, I, I, when I look at a site, I, I have to just spend some time and take it apart and say, how do I draw this? Not, is it too difficult? Um, and it's not to say that I can draw anything. It's, it's just that I don't think of it in terms of difficulty and, and in terms of time, I also don't work uh, you know, I don't sit down and start a drawing and, and do it, you know, A to B finish. You know, I might do the line work and let it sit. I do a wash. I'll work on three drawings at a time and do ink washes. And uh, of course, I, I know the amount of time they take. But um, yeah, I, mean, I can appreciate the, the reader's question. Um, and, and I suspect that there's maybe some they want to know that find that drawing that's most uh, complicated for me. But I just I really don't think of it that way. Uh, another question, for pretty much for both of you, um, what's a familiar site uh, you have wound up seeing differently? You might like the Palace of Fine Arts, right? It's just like, but is there something that stands out that you, you, you thought you knew all about it and you, now you've seen it differently from this collaboration? Paul, you want to start on that one? <laughs> sure, I, I think um, Lombard Street is, okay. is the best example because... Uh, I actually, I drew that as it was a, a gift for a very good friend of mine who uh, helped my wife and I buy our house. And, um, and I asked her, I said, what do you want? And anything, you know, anything in San Francisco you want me to draw, I'll draw it for you. And she said, I'm so sorry, you're gonna hate me for this, but I want you to draw Lombard Street. And I was, I was really happy for her. And, and in some ways she deserves a lot of credit because I, for, for helping me push through, um, I had already you know, decided I wanted to start drawing uh, iconic scenes, but she basically said, here's the top of the list, right? And so when I went out there, I was like, how do I solve this? How do I do this in a really different way? And I'm, I'm very proud of, of how I approached that. And that was the drawing that Gary saw that also illuminated to him that we could do this in a different way. And so, uh, you know, there's a little something to to those kind of challenges. You know, again, that difficulty, that was difficult. How do I draw Lombard Street? Because I thought I knew everything about it. I thought, oh, I know it's not really the crookedest street. You know, I know where that crookedest street is in San Francisco and I've been down that. Um, so, uh, and then also you've got to re realize Lombard Street had about 2000 people on it. Every given moment I went out there, and five people in vests walking up and down, yelling at everybody to get out of the street so they can stop taking pictures so cars could come by. And I'm standing amongst all of them trying to do a drawing. So uh, yeah, I'd say Lombard. Gary? Gary? And for me, just about any one of the, there's probably six or seven very famous sites in the book. And you know, I can almost choose one at random. And, and they, uh, all of them, I mean, that's the beauty of Paul's work none of them have a postcard quality. I mean, we, we've shown the Palace of Fine Arts, um, but you know, the music concourse, for example, in Golden Gate Park, which is a very, very familiar, it's in the most famous, heavily trafficked, old Eastern Bell Epoch part of Golden Gate Park. It's a, a remnant of the 1894 Midwinter's Fair. Um, and, you know, everybody who's seen that band shell and those those trees, the fountains, um, you know, it's a very, very famous place opposite the uh, De Young Museum. And Paul drew it in, in a way that, you know, you just see it afresh. So, um, you know, in the same Huntington Park, another one of uh, the little exquisite, very Parisian park on the uh, summit of Knob Hill. Uh, right across from Grace Cathedral and the grand hotels on California Street um, with its magnificent, um, you know, Italian copy of an Italian fountain that's in the, uh, in the old Jewish quarter in Rome. Um, you know, Paul's drawing of that, uh, you don't, uh, it, it breaks through all this kind of encrusted visual uh, associations that we bring to these familiar sites. 
um, you know, uh, the Lombard Street uh, at Palace. They're, they're all acquire a whole new register in the way that Paul draws them. So um, I feel like all, all of them really uh, are you know, sort of breakthroughs in terms of a received, really famous site and seeing it afresh. Okay. We, we have about 10 minutes left and I have two questions to ask. Um, one, uh, how will San Francisco change after the coronavirus? Now that may take another 30 minutes to answer, oh. but uh, you, you want to take a stab at that, uh, Paul and Gary? Maybe uh, Gary first. Oh, um, sure. Um, I mean, boy, it, it, it obviously the short answer is we don't know. Um, and we really have to hope that a lot of the wonderful institutions in this city that make San Francisco, San Francisco, everything from great cafes and restaurants to bookstores to cultural institutions, that as many as possible of them survive. And that is not guaranteed. Um, you know, there's no obvious and uh, final end of this crisis in sight yet. And the economic damage that's being done is terrible. So, you know, there's definitely great fears for a, a lot of what makes San Francisco, San Francisco, and that places that are literally irreplaceable. And if Cafe Trieste, this is, I just mentioned these because they're in my neighborhood of North Beach, if Cafe Trieste or the bars Vesuvio or Specs, uh, let alone City Lights books, or, you know, if any of these uh, places disappear, there's no replacing them. You can get another bar, you can get another restaurant, but you don't replace uh, cultural institutions. So um, that's, that's very worrisome. There's, you know, uh, there's bigger changes afoot as well, bigger demographic changes. Everyone probably is aware that rents have dropped 30% here. Um, that could have what in some ways would be a big upside of uh, the city could become more affordable to a wider range of people. Obviously, there's a big downside too. This is, has a very painful effects on, uh, on homeowners and as many small, small homeowners who are renting out. They're not all big corporate fat cats. So, you know, I'm not diminishing the, the negative aspects of that as well. Um, and of course, the, the larger impacts on the city's economy. Um, which the economy is just, you know, staggering as every American city is staggering under enormous uh, deficits and budget cuts. So, you know, we, we could in some ways go back to a city that looks a little bit more like the city that I moved into in, in the 1970s, where the rents are lower, where there's uh, the, the sort of dominance of the economy by several sectors. Right now, it's it's technology, it's finance, law, health, um, you know, the dominance of those sectors could be uh, altered and you could see a more heterogeneous, broadly based economy. But you also have to be careful, beware what you wish for, especially for a lot of progressive San Franciscans who have been like saying, be gone, be gone techies, be gone. And, uh, you know, there, I sympathize with some of that to some degree, but uh, you know, people forget that we had 10% unemployment in 2009, and that's not fun for anybody either. So um, you know, we're in we're in a very complicated place right now. We've come through it better than any other American city. We have lower infection rates than any other American city. So the city deserves a big pat on the back for its response that way. But uh, the economic, and we're not out of the health woods yet, no one is, and we're not out of, the, certainly not out of the economic woods. So um, that's a long-winded answer of saying that we, you know, it, it's all up in the air. Um, and that some good could come out of it, some bad could come out of it, and we just got to hope that it's more good than bad. Well, Paul, do you want to chime in? I think this kind of refers back to what you mentioned earlier, reinvention. <laughs> Maybe that's what we're looking at. Yeah, and in that way, you know, maybe San Francisco will have a, an, an incredible change more so than any other city because it's, it's so used to reinventing itself. Uh, what that reinvention will be, I don't want to speculate. Uh, but what I, what I do think is interesting, and this is beyond San Francisco, this is all around, is the, the change of a lot of people working from home. You know, I used to joke that, uh, you know, that every, you know, everybody else went to work and I got to just like wander into my studio. Like one of my 
uh, the ways that I measured my own success was having control of all of my own time. And I love to work so that, you know, that's not an issue for me, but uh, that's, it, it was such a, a, a disconnect between me and so many people that I knew because they had designated places to go to work where they had people expecting them to come there. Whereas I was, had this sort of free form. Whereas now it's everybody, uh, lots of people, they, they get up and they have to find the workspace in their home. They have to dedicate it. They have to uh, learn how to separate work and life. And, um, and I think it's a, a perspective shift too about how work fits into our lives and whether we love our jobs or we don't. And then maybe that forces some changes. And, um, and interestingly, I, you know, I have a studio. So now I actually get up and I commute to my studio every day. So it's, everything's sort of flipped. But what I'm looking at is now this, uh, this sense of people having a little bit more power over how they deal with their time. They said, maybe I don't wanna sit in a car an hour and a half each way a day, but you know what? And, and also how do we live? So our, our homes haven't been built necessarily with offices. Uh, you know, I mean, if we had, it'd be a great addition, but imagine if now it's as important as your kitchen or your bathroom, people are tired of working at their dining room table. So what if homes are going to start being built uh, with, hey, you've got to have an office in here. I need a place to work. What do you mean this apartment doesn't have an extra room for me to work in? And so I think this will have an effect that's even bigger than just, oh, pre-COVID, post-COVID uh, was the culture because that will change, but then that will change again. But I'm interested in how it affects our sort of home architectural and work lives. Great, thank you. Okay, last question. Um, are you two planning to collaborate again? Are there other areas or cities that you would like to explore together? Ooh, what a, what a good meatball of a question. <laughs> you have like three minutes to answer that. So okay. let's go with Gary first. I'll, I'll go first. Um, the answer is yes. Uh, Paul and I would love to collaborate again. Uh, we love doing this project. And uh, Rome and Paris are next. <laughs> uh, that, that would be our dream. You know, if, if this book is successful, and, um, and I hope it will be, um, it would be incredibly fun to take on some other great world cities uh, or Amer and American cities. Um, you know, we haven't really ruled anything out in terms of what we might do. And there, but there we've also just the other day, we were brainstorming about other projects that we could do that might be strictly San Francisco based again. So um, that's kind of we're, we're open to doing it, and I'm, but I'm sure that we will work together again. Paul, uh, why don't you take a stab? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, as Gary said, you know, the, the other night we talked after an event and we were on the phone for an hour and, uh, and half of that talk was just kicking around ideas. And I, I, I have the feeling it's like after doing this book, it's just like, oh, OK, well, all right, we, we finished that one. Uh, OK, where are we going next? Like th th that was the first stop on on a road trip and uh, I, I don't necessarily know where our end destination is but absolutely I yes this will not be the last you hear from from Gary and I <laughs> okay I'm sure we're all looking forward to that well I have to I have to say personally uh, I do a lot of research for my tours and everything you guys have shared today is all new to me <laughs> all, all oh, these great. stories so I think this is a good lesson for all of us is that never think you have it all or you know all, all that there is out there and taking again that uh, the iconic and the obscure and be able to don't think we have all the answers. So really appreciate the work you did uh, in getting this all done. Um, so I, I know for everybody, uh, it, it's new information and I really encourage everybody to get out and pick up a copy of the book. And again, the repeat the book, Spirits of San Francisco, Voyages Through the Unknown City. <laughs> I have to let you guys know, I did a, I did a little search for, uh, if you just go to Google and you search hidden or unknown or uh, mm -hmm. uh, some, it, you kept, it's like secrets and you come <laughs> up with dozens and dozens of, uh, of returns because everybody has a curiosity. What's the secret? What's an unknown? So, right. great, great part of the title. <laughs> so just to uh, bring conclusion, uh, if you'd like to watch more for Commonwealth uh, members, if you want to watch more programs and support the Commonwealth Club, uh, please visit uh, www.commonwealthclub.org. Again, thanks to Gary and Paul uh, for sharing your insights. Um, Rick Evans here, and uh, just I'll see you next time.
Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Rick. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone.